Okay. So good morning, all of you. On uh, this month's uh, tricky case uh, of the month session, we have two experts with us, Dr. Sanjay Saru from Gurgram and uh, Dr. Jayan Sampath from uh, Bangalore. We, they don't need introduction. They are very good friends of mine and quite senior colleagues with huge experience in the field. And I'm, uh, I'm sure they, they will uh, take us through a good uh, academic session. So Sheenam, would you start presenting the first case? Yes, sir. Dr. Sheenam uh, is from Amritsar and she has uh, joined us as a fellow for last one month. Yeah, Sheenam, go ahead. A very good morning to all of you. Uh, firstly, This two months old female a child came to us with a complaint of reduced movements of right upper limb and left lower limb. For 10 days, uh, there was no postnatal complication, no history of trauma was there and no history, history of hospital admission for four days due to pneumonia 10 days back was there. On clinical examination, patient was afebrile and there were reduced movements of right upper limb and left lower limb. There was oh. excessive cry on passive movements of joints. Shinam, Shinam, can you go back to the slide? First, let's, uh, let us make the history clear. So this was a normally delivered child <clears throat> discharged home the next day with uh, good birth weight and there was no uh, uh, postnatal complications required any short admission in NICU or uh, mother had also the uh, period of pregnancy was okay. There was no umbilical cord sepsis or anything. And the child presented with a very abnormal kind of uh, presentation at two months that one right upper limb and left lower limb is there's less movement. So there are two sides. And uh, clinically, child was very irritable. Yeah, can you uh, go ahead with this slide? Yes. Right, just uh, keep it here. So, uh, Jayant, what would come to your mind looking at this history for a two month old baby? Sepsis. Abscess, yeah. Sepsis, this is the one first thing we should consider. That's right. This is a female child, uh, a good family. Uh, J uh, Sanjay, would you like to think something else based on this exam and history? Dr. Sarup, Sanjay Sarup? Yeah, 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 yeah. Not really. I mean, if there is a reduced spontaneous movement of the right upper limb and then the left lower limb, they are anatomically disconnected. They are, uh, uh, so it more seems like there is a, a generalized problem that is affecting two different joints in two different anatomical settings. So one would think inflammatory, one would think sepsis. Usually two month old babies, uh, it's a bit rare to think of inflammation purely like uh, as in inflammatory arthritis, but one would think of trauma, yes. And so would, battered baby in a female battered child. Battered baby, female child. And one would think of sepsis, definitely. Especially given the history of four days of pneumonia yeah. after birth. So something has been missed at some point. But, uh, or maybe not missed, I, I, I don't know. Uh, it, it may be that the child may have a fresh sepsis due to which all this has happened. And that's why they have uh, presented to you like this. So the, what was surprising was that for child was admitted before 10 days for pneumonia. And then child, so there was one week of kind of uh, symptom free. Now all the family, six, seven family members came. So family was quite uh, caring or concerned about the child's well-being. So I, a battered baby was not uh, thought of. But, but there, was a, there was a lag period between the admission and presentation, but uh, that was a bit uh, abnormal history. Now, um, yeah, please get 
Now let's take on to the X-ray. Shinam, go ahead. Uh, we can see on the X-ray radiographs. Let's, uh, Shinam, I'll stop you there now. So we uh, got the X-rays done to see. Now, Jan, you look at this X-ray and uh, what do you think? I mean, this is not typical of infection. Yeah. So there's widespread uh, periosteal reaction. The um, looks like there is some lytic lesion in the metaphysis. Um, are these both a forearm AP or it's just? Yeah. AP? So this is again. We just took uh, both forearm X-rays for comparison, and we found mm -hmm. that there is something wrong on the other side as well. Ah. Uh, so and it looks uh, quite symmetrical to me. Um, so. Uh, it, with these sort of appearances, again, I would think, be thinking more of a systemic disease rather than infection. Because to get multiple, you know, like uh, Sanjay said, it's more inflammatory, you know, some kind of systemic mm -hmm. uh, problem uh, rather than infection. Uh, of course, infection is always a possibility. I mean, we never right. really completely exclude infection from our list of differential at this stage. Uh, it, but in with these appearances, I feel infection is less likely. I mean, what, what was the um, physical exam findings? Was there obvious uh, swelling? Child, child was very irritable. Child was very irritable. And uh, I mean, lifting the child would lead to, child would cry. Otherwise, there was no very uh, obvious swelling, you know? Mm -hmm. There was no obvious swelling. But uh... Shinam, did you stop sharing your screen? Yeah, yeah, Sanjay. Sanjay. Sorry to add, if you look at the X-ray, there is a lot of swelling of the wrist joint, which is visible on the X-ray, soft tissue swelling. There is a slip of the physis mm. of the radius as well as of the ulna. Yeah. It looks, it looks so. I don't know. I mean, that's yeah, just a moment. Share the screen. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Just, just a moment. Yeah. So. So if you can see, you know, it was kind of symmetrical on the both sides. That's what I meant, uh, Sanjay. Yeah, but there yeah, seems you know? to, uh, the, yeah. the picture on the left side yeah. seems to show a lot more destruction. Okay, let, let me, uh, let's take the lower limb x-rays. Uh, Shinam, yeah. can you move ahead? Ah, so hmm. now look at this. So I'll uh, re-inquire with yeah. Sanjay. What do you think? Uh... Yeah, again, the physis has slipped on the on the right side uh, mm. of the distal femur, mm. and um, on the on the distal femur again on the right side. Oh, sorry, proximal tibia. Mm. Uh, it's about there to is slide. A, yeah, there is a slide, but it's on the metaphysis. Yeah. Even here, it's on the metaphysis in the distal femur. Yes. Right? And uh, then again, the metaphysis is not normal on the uh, left distal femur. Mm. There seems to be a bending there of some sort. Yeah. Uh, hey, they, they, the proximal tibia also is very abnormal. Exactly. Again, it's in the metaphysis. There is some kind of buckling there. Yeah. Um, mm. So, I mean, it was very... Uh, I, I had not never seen such picture uh, in my so practice. This is, so. this is very classical of battered baby. Right. Yeah. yeah first so corner diagnosis. fractures. So this is called a yeah. This is called a metaphyseal corner fracture, and uh, <clears throat> I worked with a very big, uh, 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 you know, non-accidental. We don't call it battered baby. It's non-accidental injury. Mm -hmm. So, uh, with the world's greatest expert on non-accidental injury, called Helen Carty. She was a professor of radiology. Yeah. So she used to say in Alday in Liverpool. In so she has written a lot on the subject. So she used to say that this is called a metaphyseal corner fracture, left distal femur, if you see. Mm. So, or it's called a bucket handle type injury. So she used to say that it's pathognomonic. So this was used, this particular radiographic feature is so classical, it was used to convict people on criminal in a in a criminal court in the in the UK. Yeah. If you see a metaphyseal corner fracture in a non weight non you know in a, in a in a child who is not independently walking, parent goes to jail. <laughs> it, so, it was that so that was also I I also searched the literature and I looked at the X-rays of corner fractures, but you know they had corner fracture on all the bones. Now here is a complete metaphyseal kind of linear. No, this is so, different. 
This is it's different. Li it's little different than that. Yeah, yeah, uh, it's different. But I'm just pointing to the yeah, yeah, yeah. So that was again a differential we were thinking. Yeah, yeah. Right. And so again, uh, any any fellow want to uh, have have seen such kind of uh, picture or uh, you have any comment? Anyone? So let let's go on to the uh, laboratory markers. Uh, Shinam, go ahead. Yeah, so this is what uh, we thought of differentials, uh, as you said, multifocal osteoma battered babies, curvy again, yeah. curvy it, it has physical. No, uh, never... I, I would not. I would not call it uh -huh. scurvy at all because yeah. scurvy looks very different. It's the physis that slips. There is nothing mm -hmm. wrong with the metaphysis. First and I this is scurvy, the periosteal yeah. collection and all. With you the, the may or may not, but pathognomically, it is the physis that slips. I mean, I've seen. Uh, a few yeah. and it's very clear. and there is a ballooning of periosteum true with, uh, all of that but uh, the physis just slips it's yeah. just the physis so you don't in scurvy you don't have that metaphysial reaction and that lysis and all that no you is would not right? yeah yeah you would not you would not so I, this I, was <clears throat> this is something what which we were thinking and we have never seen this scurvy in this young child you know two months yeah and then so, i also read about scurvy that the children who are uh, fed, uh, breastfed, so maternal milk contains enough amount of vitamin C, so they cannot develop scurvy. So again, that was going against the, yeah, so or it is something else. So let's see what blood investigations uh, brought. Um, so we posted in pediatric orthopedics group and they advised to get lab investigations done for syphilis. Uh, just a moment. Oh, Sinem, you are going too fast. Okay. So what happened, no? Uh, blood investigation was also looking haywire. Like hemoglobin was 4.9. Total count was 16,000. And CRP was also raised a little bit. So the one question was why hemoglobin is so much low. 4.9 for a uh, two-month-old is too low. And uh, certainly there is some infective thing going on. CRP was around 25 or something. Uh, so, we posted this case on our Pedipod group and Sandeep Vaidya said that he had seen one case with multiple metaphysial affection or multiple metaphysitis in syphilis, congenital syphilis. So, I never uh, have tested for it. So, I inquired with my pathologist and he said there is 750 rupees test, antibody test should be done both in mother and the child. And I and as nothing was else was clicking, I said, let's get it done. And Shinam showed the result. BD, so is this the old VDRL? Yeah. Oh. Huh? It's, you, not, you, you, it's not VDRL. Not it's, VDR. okay. it, is, it is TPHA. Yeah, TPHA. it's a treponoma, okay, okay. treponoma pallidum. Uh, oh, TPHA, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah it says TPHA, yeah. So, so this was positive for both the mother as well as child. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, and Mother showed a uh, treponema pallidum antibody positive, uh, 25, it was 25, and TPHA was in the titers of 1 is to 5120. So it's, it's not torch, but it is congenital syphilis, Chinmay. And the uh, multiple metaphysitis is very uh, classical in syphilis. So this was the first case in last 15 years of practice. What Dr. Rujuta said that uh, they it was very common in 80s and 90s. Mm. And I sh and shared with the senior pediatrician, they said uh, it did not appeal us because we are practicing in uh, NICU for 30 years. We have seen many. Oh. But in pediatric practice, we have not. So, yeah, Shinam, show us the literature, what literature says and... So, what is the difference between congenital syphilis and uh, neonatal sepsis presentation? We can see this paper uh, studied 29 patients with congenital syphilis and compared with the results of neonatal sepsis. And they have uh, they studied that in uh, congenital syphilis also we can see high CRP. And we can also see sepsis here. So TLC amounts can also be raised in congenital syphilis also. 
So what is the difference? Uh, you know, we, we lost we, her. We we cannot hear you. Can you? Oh, mute हो गया शायद. No, there is a signal loss. Just the minute. She is in the room beside. She is talking. Let me go. So just looking at this slide, I think hepatosplenum megaly seems to be a very yes, 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 yes. A uh, prominent uh, feature, which hardly ever happens in sepsis. And uh, abdominal distension, okay. rash. So, मैं बोलूँ तो स्लाइड को एडवांस कर दूँ एक स्लाइड एडवांस कर दो आप सो आर वी सेइंग दैट सो द हिपेटोस्प्लेनो मेगाली इज अ साइन बट ऑफ कोर्स वी कैन नॉट एज अ ऑर्थोपेडिशियन इट्स डिफिकल्ट टू जज आई आई ट्राइड टू चेक इट बट आई आई डिड नॉट फाइंड माय निक्यो कलीग सेड दैट देयर वाज हिपेटोस्प्लेनो मेगाली एंड द ट्रीटमेंट इज पेनिसिलिन सो they started with penicillin both for mother as well as the baby in the in one week's admission the child is doing very well hemoglobin has come up so we went yesterday to in the ni nicu and the pain has now started regressing after one week of admission so uh, we tried to find out what is the long term outcome of post syphilis metaphysitis uh, whether whether there is any uh, long term effect like the pneumococcal i have learned when i visited james fernandez in sheffield he said pneumococcal septicemia leads to long term physical abnormalities but we are not aware about uh, what happens meningococcal meningococcal. Ah, mening meningococcal sorry yeah meningococcal so, septicemia is a, is very it's a nasty yeah. problem we get quite a few meningococcal sepsis yeah. here in our uh, picu mm -hmm. uh, and it's a really nasty it causes amputation of because they get some kind of vasculitis and you have to amputate their limbs and things so yeah. they get a lot of gangrene and multiple physical vascular insults so so we we have not uh, known what would happen to this child but we'll keep them in follow up i think yes, okay. uh, i think the prognosis is very good once you treated the syphilis okay. that's the first thing then i mean as a general comment because we need to move on to the next one as a general comment first we would want to see that okay when the case is being presented then the physical examination should have been stronger and brought out more uh, you know and the history was all up and down so we thought something else turned out to be something else one thing clear though that um, uh, the, it turned out to be an infection not a mm. battered baby so now the question is do you have a lot of syphilis in liverpool jane never seen it i'm just wondering why whether too many people are going to jail just for the heck of it <laughs> actually you know like, <laughs> i mean i just I, i hope you won't put this on youtube or something but you know i wouldn't put syphilis past the average liverpoolian <laughs> i mean i'm thinking the, the the chaps in liverpool are not very uh, you know yeah. not very dis uh, discreet <laughs> yes, so. i wouldn't put it past them really <laughs> all right okay yeah. there we are so i mean yeah very nice case very good yeah. Let, let's move on to the next one shalin are you present are you sharing your screen yeah dr shalin shah has finished his fellowship with us uh, last few days here and he is moving to wadia for further fellowship training oh very yeah. nice and shalin was a recipient of the best paper award in this posi so yeah shalin please share your screen so uh, today we have another case of osteomyelitis uh, so this case was first presented to us by a general surgeon he sent a message to sir that he had an interesting case and he would like uh, sir's opinion and uh, the child was a one year two month old girl who presented with pain and swelling over the right foot there was mild fever and raised crp and the surgeon did an Uh, IND of the swelling over the right foot, and he says that she responded well. She responded well up till a month, and uh, this was the photo uh, he sent us. Initial picture, uh, the picture at the end of one month of treatment of the right foot. He said that it's been a month now, and this is the foot with slight recurrence of the swelling, and 
there is a swelling over the uh, contralateral hand also which has developed the and at the end of one month the child has again started reduced movement of the right foot and the left hand a similar picture to the case which was presented earlier so sir as that what was the culture report in the histopathological examination and the surgeon said that he did not send that but he had started the child on iv antibiotics high grade antibiotics and she had respond, responded well to that until now so sir asked that whether any imaging was carried out and he said that no imaging has been carried out yet so he said that he will send the child here and uh, you can get an x ray and for the imaging if required so that's why i we termed him a doctor allu arjun you know <laughs> <laughs> so you know they they do everything and um, and so I I saw clear pus but uh, I did I didn't send for culture sensitivity or biopsy because they respond well. This was osteomyelitis, so why you want to send it for uh, biopsy? And um, uh, and in my experience, it has responded well to the lincomycin and this and that. So and child was doing well, but. you know it has come back again so i think this is very interesting case molin you should look into it now i said okay <laughs> but uh, the 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 key principle which we teach all the fellows biopsy all the infections and culture all the tumors so that that we should follow you know whenever you take pus always send it for culture because sometimes you get um, fixed and uh, you don't know what what the underlying pathology is right so shalin please move ahead with the case and then we'll inquire the faculty so at this point the child presented to us the complaint presentation of pain and swelling was the right foot reduced active movements of the right lower limb and the left upper limb mainly below the elbow at the left hand there was uh, no high grade fever no significant weight loss and no family history of tb tb contacts uh for past history history of fever and swelling 3 months ago ind was done 2 months ago over the right foot and there was on and off low grade fever which the child was passing through on a detailed examination there was tenderness could be elicited over the right foot with withdrawal and there was diffuse swelling over the left hand which had also developed and uh, the swelling was also tender the rest of the examination was normal so next we went ahead and uh, got an x ray and this was the x ray picture of the right foot and the left hand so the right so let us stop there shalin and uh, jayant based yeah. on this history what Looks do you think like there is? is some fragmentation of the cuboid a cuboid uh, yeah which roughly corresponds with the surgical uh, incision site so yeah. that definitely i would um uh, you know take as an abnormality uh, and um i'm not and sure. x-ray looks okay i mean it is yeah. no no there is something uh, yeah, the, the middle finger appears swollen mm. and uh, the proximal phalanx of the middle finger does not appear to be normal i mean that's what i can see i have the benefit of a laptop here okay so uh, there is mild periosteal reaction it mm. seems to be yeah proximal yeah. phalanx yeah yeah, yeah. so yeah. um, again uh, similar case in a month's time affection of foot affection of hand uh, and the previous surgeon said he retrieved pus uh, uh, what further you would advise for investigation do you have labs uh, shalin at this point yes sir so we have the labs and the hemoglobin was 8.5 the total count was marginally on the upper side with 16500 total count and the differential count had lymphocytosis and the crp was 22 so all of these signs 22 so, by how much what yeah, is the so control the normal one or so one, one is to one, uh, one to six is the normal control here and so five is not okay yeah it's a uh, four times raised four times so okay. so what uh, what would you think uh, is it uh, some Uh, uh, bacterial osteomyelitis or tuberculosis or any other pathology we should look into it or how should we investigate and treat uh, manage it further yes sanjay what do you think oh yeah um, well 
uh, seems to be a pretty clear cut history that yeah there has been a, a month of um, activity in the hand and the and the foot uh, the surgeon had gone down thinking it's osteomyelitis incised it now he has a scar i believe there is a sinus i think there is a pus discharge there yes, is that, that correct that healed that healed yeah that healed so yeah. he had put the child on uh, uh, what lincomycin and other things yeah. but when i look at the 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 picture of the foot there does not seem to be so much of uh, erythema there and there seems mm. to be a sinus scar it is healed no doubt but yeah. there and there is uh, a lot of destruction of the uh, of the cuboid bone yeah. there, right but what seems to um, kind of guide the direction of my diagnosis is looking at that finger and mm. it is a dactylitis it seems to be a right. dactylitis now i may be just shooting uh, completely no, from no, the hip here but uh, if there is a dactylitis of the hand it kind of you know guides me on to is this tuberculosis so in that case probably uh, two things would be required or few things would be required we would think in terms of doing a montus we would mm. do a chest x ray and it would be very nice to uh, look at an mri of these two areas if the mri shows fair amount or, or if there's a collection or something one would think of draining and taking a biopsy at the same time i right. think a biopsy here would be advisable but if the uh, or would anybody would jayant like to add some investigation here anything no. so before that you know uh, last month uh, sandeep patwardhan and colleague they presented uh, in jbjs tuberculous osteomyelitis of cuboid Oh. so when i saw this child that came to my mind i looked at uh, sandeep's paper and the images were looking quite similar and then uh, this dactylitis although i could not see that periosteal reaction on x ray but uh, that came to my mind that it can be tuberculosis so yeah jayant would you like to add anything no absolutely nothing to add really that's that's the right line of thought okay because dac so, tuberculous dactylitis is a, is a again is very classical So, so Mantux a... Mantux was negative or equivocal, I would say. Yeah. Chest X-ray was clear. So let's see the MRI pictures. What? Um... So the chest X-ray was clear. The child had already been vaccinated with BCG, and uh, for and still for the, the Mantux yeah. Mantux did not didn't guide yeah. you in any which way. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So for further investigation, we went ahead and did an MRI. and we did an mri uh, concerning with the right foot as well as the, as well as the left hand so this were the t2 weighted images of the foot showed uh, marrow changes in the calcaneum as well destruction of the cuboid uh, bone and uh, uh, surrounding soft tissue swelling around the calcaneum calcaneo cuboid joint and, and there uh, is ankle effusion also uh, and and there yeah. was uh, reported synovitis over the ra- right ankle so this were the images of the foot so stop here shali and uh, yes. jayant now of course cuboid is destroyed see the calcaneum is all kind of whitish yeah and so some TV, places in pelvis pelvic head also there are so we see that uh, this tuberculous thing is disseminated in the uh, foot bones but this was uh, does it look alarming i mean it's not typical of tuberculosis yeah Sanjay? no with, with this sort of appearance then tb is less likely because tb does not spread like this usually i mean it can still be tb it's not to say unless you have a tissue diagnosis you cannot really you know rule out anything um, but with this sort of appearance well again tb becomes less likely when you have contiguous spread to different bones in the foot without um without uh, concomitant changes on the x-ray uh, you can get contiguous spread even with tb but then you would expect to see sort of corresponding changes on the x-ray to show that how the infection has spread across and tb is also notorious for spreading from metaphysis to the epiphysis and from the epiphysis to the metaphysis across the physis so uh the so called you know the collar stud sort of appearance so yeah tb can do a lot of things so it doesn't exclude tb at this point but yeah. it it seems yeah. like i will have to consider other diagnoses as well with this right. sort of right. 
Yeah, Sanjay, your comment and Shalin, other images, please. Uh, I um, I would think that because the baby is only one year and two months old, the blood supply is extremely good, and that that sets up a stage for a wider spread to the uh, if it's an infective tuberculosis. Also, when you look at the the picture, the the photograph, mm -hmm. there is not too much of a reaction on the outside. Mm. So that again kind of makes me think tuberculosis will make me think, oh, it, could it be some kind of an inflammatory osteitis? Mm. These are the two things, like a non non bacterial. Yeah, yeah. These are the uh, because I do seem to see them more than now. I'm see used this, to. San Sanjay. See this. Yeah. Again, the, yeah. So all uh, the, the meta the, metacarpals and you know, yeah, everything. And in, in the when the first metacarpal is, it seems that there is some periosteal, subperiosteal uh, fifth collection. Uh, fifth, a uh, fifth and the first both. Yeah, yeah. Look, look at the below image on yeah, the left. Yeah, 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 yeah. And again, that would be so. Um, but okay. Usually, to see two two metacarpals in the same X-ray. Yeah. So rare. again, there was. Anyways, mm. and this was a bit recent development. The first was a foot. Anyway, so we didn't have any clue. So I thought that the cuboid area was more uh, approachable and more. So I will go back there. We'll do biopsy. And there was effusion in the ankle. So I'll, I'll aspirate it and see. And then send for culture and uh, biopsy and see what, what it comes out to be. Okay. Yeah, Shalin, go ahead. Yeah. So with these images, we went ahead and planned for biopsy. and. Uh, if any infection would be found, we plan for a debridement. So we first we aspirated the ankle joint and we found this uh, serous yellow colored fluid, uh, straw colored fluid, which was aspirated from the ankle joint. So this was, you know, looking more brownish rather than yellow. And I have, I remember this kind of fluid I retried in a few cases of Gaucher's disease with osteomyelitis. Their marrow is brown. So first thing when I aspirated, I thought, oh, this is not looking, uh, uh, this is looking something dicey, you know. So when I sent this material for a biopsy, I asked my pathologist that uh, you just find out, but in Gaucher's patients are more sick. They have splenomegaly and they're immunocompromised. Uh, this child was not looking like that, but uh, this was not uh, looking like a typical uh, bacterial pus, you know. <clears throat> Yeah, Shalin, go ahead. Yes, and this was the tissue which was sent for histopathological examination along with culture. So we went, we sent all of these tissues for uh, gene expert uh, routine bacterial cultures and histopath histopathological examination. The reports for tuberculosis came back negative. The gene expert was negative. The synovial, uh, the synovitis, the fluid aspirated showed slightly less glucose and a few uh, 500 cells per cubic mm with uh, mild lymphocytes increased in the, uh, flu in the fluid which was aspirated. The culture came positive for E. coli, which was sensitive to uh, cefepime, tazobactam, uh, cefosalbactam, and the carbapenem group of drugs. So, so this was gram-negative osteomyelitis. Uh, it came out to be... Disseminated, again, so it's disseminated hematogenous yeah. gram-negative osteomyelitis. Hmm. So this yeah. is extended spectrum beta lactamase. Yeah, yeah, quite often, again, when you have a gram-negative infection, I, I, this is just anecdotal and personal experience. I don't see such a huge uh, erythema or pain or, um, you know, fever. I yeah. don't know whether you all have the same experience, but so, sometimes so I, I agree with you, uh, Sanjay. We, with gram negative, we don't see this. Uh, it's a focal infection. It's not kind of disseminated like this. So again, that was a question for me. And let's see what happens next. Yeah, go ahead, Charlene. So we so, started with gram negative, this sensitive antibiotic administration yeah, so and clearly to... observed this CBC. Yeah. So according to this, the IV antibiotics were started. And after at follow-up also, the child had persistently raised uh, total count, 25,500 total count with uh, differential count showing lymphocytosis. The CRP, however, had come down to normal uh, and the HP was similar to the previous values. So 
because of the persistently increased total count, uh, we uh, went ahead and consulted with the pathologist, and he show he told us that there was some abnormality in the uh, blood cells also, and he asked us to consult a, a hematologist. So this is such two investigations at two days interval. Hemoglobin was going down, down, down. So next test shows a seven hemoglobin count was twenty six thousand. CRP was normal. So again, this was abnormal. That why CRP has turned normal and count is going up, and hemoglobin is going down. And so finally, I we took help of our hema, uh, hematologist that what's going on, and he said you get the hema, uh, HB electrophoresis done. And show the result of that, uh, Shalin. Yeah, and the histopathological examination also showed presence of uh, infective tissue, and uh, with uh, some amount of uh, sclerotic and uh, necrotic bone tissue present, which was suggested. But no granuloma. No granuloma. No granuloma. That's the most it's... important thing with yeah. the biopsy here. Yeah. So. Go ahead. And uh, the hematologist advised us HB electrophoresis and sickling test, and the report came out came back positive for sickle cells. The sickling was positive in this case. So in early smear, you know, uh, in early sickle crisis, sometimes you may not see on the routine peripheral smear, and you might need to do uh, HB electrophoresis, where it will show there are so seventy percent cells. Can you go ahead, Shalin, and show that report if you have PDF? Sure. Go ahead. Yeah, so the PDF is not available for the report, but uh, different, uh, yeah. Right. So, so this was sequel cell anemia associated gram negative osteomyelitis. And that's why the picture was a bit haywire. So Shalin, take us through the literature on it. Yeah, and so the, the various uh, reports as well as studies which are available for uh, infants with sickle cell disease. In fact, one of the study says that almost 45% of children with sickle cell disease would have an episode of dactylitis by the time they reach two years of age, especially those associated with severe genotypes. And... Uh, uh, the differential between the osteomyelitis and uh, dactylitis is a very important one because all both these cases will present with pain, reduced limb movement, low-grade fever, and uh, mild uh, swelling as well as erythema may be present in some cases. So uh, they uh, this is a study which has uh, tried to differentiate osteomyelitis from vasoocclusive crisis. And uh, they have mentioned that they have found in based on their study that individuals with osteomyelitis were more likely to have a preceding fever, uh, longer duration of pain and swelling over the affected limb. And those with vasoocclusive pain were more likely to have one side affected and a lower WBC count. However, in our case, there was already osteomyelitis and uh, as a result of uh, which was the cause of high WBC count along with surrounding dactylitis and uh, vasoocclusive crisis of other bones as well as the upper limb. So the child was started on hydroxyurea, the treatment for sickle cell, and uh, she responded well. And uh, at present, uh, the plaster is off from the uh, lower limb and she's doing well. The scar is also healed and uh, the upper limb movement has also improved. <laughs> So now these uh, zigsaw puzzles are that why there was a lot of edema in the bones, uh, in calcaneum and in the hand bones. So that was probably sickle cell crisis. The moment PCV was infused, child came out of uh, the sickle cell uh, crisis and pain was uh, substantially reduced. The wound healed. And then I called Dr. Allu Arjun that this turned out to be sickle cell osteomyelitis. And did I say you? It is an interesting case. That's what this reaction. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it was. It is very interesting. So, so, so nice uh, observations is... by Sanjay that ductilitis. So when we see ductilitis, we should think of tuberculosis first. And also now we should keep in mind of sequel. The second thing I learned is this: the routine smear may not show sequel cells in infants. It needs a, a longer 
disease to produce sickle sickle cells in the peripheral smear and hb electrophoresis uh, needs to be done in some patients jayant was saying something yeah jayant please no no he the, this mode of presentation is uh, very characteristic of dheeren ganjwala he only tells it like a story but shalin the one thing that you missed out is you should have a photograph of dr ala arjun on his phone <laughs> and then on the on the next slide you should have a photograph of dr molin on his phone so it makes it look more so that's sh- the way sh- dr dheeren does it don't you agree molin it's this is yeah, very yeah. much so like i a, i uh, we had a similar session whatsapp uh, issue so i said shalin shalin's wife is not keeping well otherwise he could have shown some animations as well he is also good at animation Very anyways good. thank you Excellent. shalin for that shinam are you ready with the third case yes sir yes sir yeah. we have two more cases uh, we'll quickly go through i know uh, sanjay is getting late but aren't they interesting sanjay oh damn interesting very good very very good inam uh, can you share your screen quickly or uh, if there is a problem then shalin can go with the second case <clears throat> ah good this is pretty straight forward case and we need more input from experts in this uh, yeah a 12 year old boy a non case of hypophosphatemic crickets came to us with the deformity of both legs the right side deformity was more than the left he was already on treatment with phosphorus calcium and vitamin d and uh, all the lab markers were nearly corrected so uh, when he came to us uh, his gait uh, we can see his gait on radiographs a uh, mechanical axis was pass- passing through uh, more than three zone and left side distal uh, femoral angle was 105 and right side 108 and proximal medial uh, tibial angle was also 78 and 70 on right side right shinam let's go back to the x ray yes right so jayant and sanjay one by one what is your uh, approach of dealing with this children uh, when they present little later no i know that if they are with us for pretty long time we would do growth modulation but now this is 10 years old with this significant deformity uh, i would, would, I would still do growth management? modulation because okay. hypophosphatemic rickets even though um, Uh, you know they, there's a very high chance of recurrence uh, of the deformity after correction that's a problem but they grow for a very long time so uh, the many hypophosphatemic rickets that i've taken care of they have open physis at 18 20 years i even have a 21 year old girl with okay. hypophosphatemic rickets who has open physis i don't know i've never read the literature about this but having seen enough number of cases i think skeletal maturity is actually delayed in them for some reason i don't know i'm not i'm not really read seriously about this but i know that i can use growth modulation for longer so even so that, in the older that we, age, we also have it. seen I, i would not say those are open physis but there is metaphyseal rarefaction which gives you a pseudo appearance uh-huh. because there that's we see in our comprehensive bone health clinic very routinely and their overall length is less um you know and so growth modulation my question is i also did growth modulation in this case but how successful growth modulation in relatively older children say 10 12 years old with this magnitude of deformity sanjay what is your experience see my experience with uh, hypophosphatemic rickets is this uh, that their their metaphysis is very very soft i have had a few failures with growth modulation at an early age in the sense that they, uh, the the there has been a screw uh, migration uh, in uh, two of my cases in the past so what i really insist on is a lot of medical management and strengthening of the bone 
then look at the cora and do an osteotomy that's what i usually do also i feel that for instance there is this case if you draw the all the lines you see most of the deformity is in the diaphysis above yeah now at this point if you put in a growth modulator the apex of that correction the center of that correction is at the physis and it may not give you a very satisfactory result because there is a lot of bending of the diaphysis one has to think of that as well so yes. i so I, that I, happens uh, sanjay we i have done one girl mm -hmm. so so earlier on she was like this mm. but then she has gone into valgus from knee but both the tibia and femur are still still bent so, yeah so, so that there becomes, we need to do osteotomy at the later yeah. date so so it's not a it's not a very simple thing to correct this in the sense that you would want to look at every segment very carefully and see whether where and all what correction is required for instance in this case your resident said the proximal tibial Uh, metaphys uh, the angle in the proximal tibia is i think she said it's 78 70 something 70 yeah. 70 but if you look at the proximal tibia itself it looks pretty normal to me correct you understand now all the deformity is in the middle and the distal the diaphyseal yeah yeah so now if i put a, a growth modulator up there the bend below will still remain i think yeah 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 That's yeah, true. so I I think what we need to do is osteotomies realign the joints, <laughs> and even then there are sometimes you find that you may still need to apply a, a an eight plate in order to optimize the joint line. The even question though is Sanjay, like say if we do an osteotomy in ten years old, mm. the S child would grow, so it will start bending from the bottom probably. So there you have to revise your. implant would you would you do telescopic rodding osteotomy and telescopic rodding or something like that sanjay uh, i usually use a plate it's plate, okay. uh, yeah because um if i have to use a telescopic rod i have to put them in spikers and uh, they take a long time to heal and the control is not very good this is my personal experience so far so that I make, is right yeah yeah huh? The and, healing is delayed. I, I I agree with that. Yeah, and and then uh, you see the telescoping rod has um, very often uh, let me down, especially if there is an anterior bow on the femur. Then I feel uh, sometimes there is a distal cutout. It it comes up. Hmm. It comes as, yeah, yeah, it comes anteriorly, and so on and so forth. So I I really concentrate on getting their bone strength up to normal by making sure that they have taken medicines for a year at least, and then go and do some corrective osteotomies, and that has served me well. They are also quite obese, most of them. Yeah. I mean, I I find that very uh, commonly. So it's not easy to control them with a, a telescopic rod. I would put a nail. I would put a plate. Another thing is, you know, uh, you you do not need a phosphorus level more than three point five. So they Enjoy. will never achieve that phosphorus level. What our True. endo team does is they look at the alkaline phosphatase. You know, True. so phosphorus level might be two point five, two point seven, but still you can go in. Yeah. And in this patients where they are they are on phosphorus for one year, two years, their bone their bones are very strong. It's it if they are like routine. It's not very soft bone. But if they are not treated well, then as you said, there will be very. Yeah. 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 Fine. Yeah. So. That's my approach was to do growth modulation to start with and uh, get near the puberty skeletal maturity and then you do osteotomy so you can get away with only one intervention the other problems giant i found that they have a lot of laxity you know so yeah. even though bones are straight when they stand up they look uh, bent so have you done anything for that laxity you know besides this or it goes away by itself as time goes yeah i have i have i have never had to uh, deal separately with the lateral ligament laxity particularly in severe genuvarum uh, but it is a problem so on table it looks like your mechanical axis is nicely corrected when you do osteotomies uh, but then when the child stands you find that they they, they sag into varus again yeah. uh, so recently i have started to brace some of them i'm currently yeah. treating uh, one patient with very severe genuvarum uh, uh who has pradavilli syndrome so so the, it it is it is a problem but 
in in my experience i always add a lateral eight plate so i i find that the growth modulation kind of gives me that uh, little bit of extra correction that i need after the osteotomy so for genuvarum i almost always combine a metaphyseal yeah. osteotomy with a with with lateral eight plate Yes, Sanjay. What is your experience? Does this ligamentous laxity persist, or it goes away with long-term brace wearing? Uh, what has been your experience? Well, if your mechanical axis is properly corrected, and then over a period of time, this would settle down. Having said that, I cannot say that I have any great experience here, because yeah. most of my hypophosphatemic cricketers are uh, patients who have come in from abroad, and follow-up is nothing afterwards. Okay. and there are there are a few indian patients but uh, i mean they have so many other problems uh, they are so obese and i have not so been able to this, successfully you know, brace anybody huh? yeah with this comprehensive clinic we catch them early we mm. do this growth modulation now mm. so there are very few patients who, who reach to this level you know yeah okay so shinam show us what what we have done Yeah, so we discuss this uh, growth modulation was done on the distal femoral side and proximal tibia both yeah and so two you know, years later deformity reduced and then we thought of doing uh, we did a tibial osteotomy and fix it with the nail so now the another question is uh, the size of nail you know what sort of nail you use jank for tibia tibial correction oh um uh, so this child has reached skeletal maturity already yeah mm -hmm. so i mean look i mean you can use a humeral i have used humeral nails in in yeah. uh, ch children with skeletal dysplasia etc for the femur i have never used um, lock tibial nails um uh, other than for uh, uh, fibrous dysplasia so for fibrous dysplasia i use this um, uh, whatever they have this uh, fancy adult nail with uh, multiple locking options uh, so expert tibia nail kind of expert so, tibia that's the one the expert tibial nail yeah. is what i use so we uh, the here the shortest tibial locking nail would also not fit to this uh, tibial length mm -hmm. so we resorted to humerus interlock nail yeah so humerus nail yeah That's and uh, yeah. yeah so we we thought we'll do things in sessions like uh, sections so first we corrected tibia as sanjay mentioned this is all uh, we we could cone down to a diaphy i although there are multi apical deformity but when you put your rema it abuts to the diaphysis so we cheat a bit and do a diaphysical correction the key thing is to use a shorter size nail a, a smaller size nail because you have to accommodate bit of translation also so yeah sanjay your take or your comment on this no it looks quite good there okay. is a bit of wearers that you are left with in the tibia yeah but overall still... the alignment i am happy in the sense that i would want especially in this child the joint line of the ankle to be parallel at least parallel to the joint okay. line of the uh, upper mm. tibia so there we, seems we to be but have... this may be false you know when you take a long film the mm. the ankle usually shows up in valgus mm. but that is yeah you could have corrected a little more now this is again a standing x ray so oh. uh, i don't know maybe if you take a dedicated film of the tibia um yeah. and and center it on a big film so, that might show you better so when we flex the knee it was looking all straight huh. and uh, yeah shinam go ahead So this is just before the second correction you know before the femoral osteotomy this child came mm. and then we uh, two years later we did third surgery that is femoral lateral clothing wedge osteotomy and fix it with the expert tibia nail so now you can see uh, just go like get to the x ray So you can see that this uh, growth modulation has exhausted. The screws are coming out. So, but I agree, Jayant. This is even though child has reached eighteen, 
this is probably faces are open or something as you said that that might be a possibility because the eight plate is coming backing out so all it is inducing some correction we don't know no i so, i i think eight plate is backing out just because they or maybe they they don't have a very good purchase in this board but these bones were very strong I, very strong you, huh? very okay. strong yeah okay. And so this again, we come down to the diaphysis and we use expert TBL nail, and uh, we could have used a little longer nail on one side, but we we resorted to be correct. Now show the final result, Sheena. Yes. So he is here now and uh, pretty happy from here to here. So the other thing is, uh, whenever you correct, where is they all have a little internal to be a torsion. So it's very yeah. Important. So we corrected that torsion. Yes, yes, yes. That's important. Yeah, that's that's very important. So you have to derotate it also. That's right, and that's a that's an issue where you need a good assistant because you have to hold while you lock the distal screw. You have to hold the segments nicely because you want to use a, a narrower nail or smaller nail to allow a bit of translation. and then uh, if you fail to lock it very efficiently then it may go back in internal rotation so uh, for young trainees and fellows have to uh, a good fellow or co colleague and that will help you was there sagittal plane deformity yeah there is a bit of procurvatum deformity as you can see on the first uh, clinical picture and as jayant mentioned there is always a procurvatum deformity and uh, you have to correct you have to do a bit hyper extend at the osteotomy site your wedge should be more anterior uh, and lateral based yes you know find uh, it's yeah. it's very useful to get a uh, proper ap and later lateral centered x rays and then i actually trace out the entire bone and then i do all my corrections and see where i have to do the osteotomy and you know whether it has to be a opening wedge closing wedge and i take wedges out and i try and do this surgery on paper um just to get in my mind you know some idea as to how i should be proceeding during the operation so i think uh, you know particularly i maybe i don't do it so often now but when i was when i was starting my practice yeah. i used to do it very very you know almost with every case i used to do that paper exercise just to get the steps of the operation clear It yeah, that's that's very right. And at times in very severe deformity, I also ended up uh, taking out a trapezoid wedge, a small trapezoid wedge. Shortening because do shortening, uh, yeah. Shortening or a better correction. And actual ultimate length is more, as you can see in this image also. The child gains weight because it becomes straighter. So. He is relatively happy now. Still, I am not very happy because there is, as Jain uh, Sanjay mentioned, there is some residual thing. And then, when this child is lying, it looks pretty straight. But there is some laxity, and I hope it would get corrected uh, with time. He is how old is he now? I think he is twenty now. Twenty. So huh? Yeah. Maybe you can offer him a little more surgery. so that he can get into a proper valgus alignment because uh, i mean with long standing deformity they have unhealthy joints the joints mm. are a little sick so they do need that optimal alignment in order for these joints to last a long time this is my my take maybe so you go to the fujisawa point uh, whatever just lateral to the just lateral to the center mechanical axis yeah? yeah. maybe in 2023 <laughs> we'll do something <laughs> yeah show us Show us something, yeah, which is different. Fine, thank you, Shreenam, for that case, and let's move on quickly to the last case, and uh, I'll, uh, I'll ask Shalin to run through it. We'll uh, take it, but I'm so sorry. You'll have to excuse me. Yeah, yeah, no, no problem. Jayant is here. Getting, Jayant is there. I'm getting late, but it was wonderful. Really yeah, enjoyed. Thanks, really thanks, enjoyed. Sanjay, for your thank you. Nice meeting you, Sanjay. Yes, and thank okay. you to all the residents as well. Thank you. I I I got your half an hour more than what you promised. Yes, Shalin, can you share your screen? And Jayant is there, so we we don't want anyone else but Jayant for this case. Ah, the 
case of equinocchio virus put in cerebral palsy and uh, so uh, the this child had a history of preterm delivery at 28 weeks by c section history of delayed cry and an icu stay for a week uh, the motor milestones were delayed with independent walking starting at 3 years of age so at the a clinical visit at the first clinical examination, the hip abductor spread was terminally restricted. There was no, uh, no hip FFD and Duncan LI test was negative. Uh, the knee showed popliteal angle on the affected side, right side to be 40 degrees and the left side to be 20 degrees and uh, no change with popliteal shift. And ankle showed a dorsiflexion to be restricted with knee flexion as well as extension. There was just marginal five degree of change in both of these, uh, which was suggestive of an equinus contracture. There was reduced tibialis anterior power and uh, we could elicit tibialis posterior spasticity on eversion. And uh, there was a stiff cavus and Joe test was positive. So... Uh, this so, was Shalin, a, if I just stop you there, yeah. see the way to present a CP case, right, is yes. the first sentence should be, this is a, whatever, eight-year-old child with unilateral or bilateral CP. Is it spastic, dystonic, or mixed pattern and GMFCS level? Yeah. Yeah. So, those are the key bits of information I want. I want age. I want what is the GMFCS level. I want to know what is the predominant motor disorder. And I want to know what is a topographical classification. Yes, sir. So it's a yeah. nine-year-old nine year old boy with right side hemiplegic cerebral palsy, a GMFCS2. And uh, spastic. Spastic. Uh, spastic cerebral palsy. OK. And, uh, if you give me those four bits of information, no, that's it. I don't need anything else from you. Yes. Right, so that is that is called. Um, um, it, um, it, you, you're just trying to get the problem down. Okay, you, so you started off with cerebral palsy. Cerebral palsy is of hundreds of different types. So you're just narrowing down, down to what is the problem. So the minute you've said, it's a nine-year-old child, right hemiplegic, spastic cerebral palsy, right? GMFCS mm -hmm. level two. Next thing I want to know is what is the sagittal gait pattern. Yes, so we okay, were. Meters gauge and Hicks. So you yes, need to so, tell me what is the sagittal gait pattern. So these are all standard ways of presenting a, a, a child, you know, the case of a child with cerebral palsy. Yeah, this is for all residents, and this is the international convention that is accepted now. So if you went on a overseas fellowship or something like that, this is the way they would expect you to think, right? Um, so uh, and all the other data that you've presented is 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 good. Uh, and, and all that's fine, but drill down to the essential details. Okay, let's get, so now child has a foot problem. What is the sagittal gait pattern? Winter's so, classification. So we had a video and I was going to get to the pattern okay. after that. Yeah, uh, great. Sir. So this is more important. So you've got to get to it in that order, right? Yes, sir. So, and then you tell me what is the sagittal gait pattern and then you tell me the physical exam finding. Yes, so uh, it was a jump knee type of gait uh, with a, a restricted knee terminal extension and a equinus contracture. So that's a type three. Yeah, type three. Okay. So we have a video showing the sagittal plane as well as the coronal plane. Yeah, so that's a jump knee. Hmm. So on the opposite side, the the left leg, you can see that there is a vault. Um, vault is plantar flexion in mid stance of the contralateral ankle to allow clearance of the foot. Yeah, you see that? Yes, sir. So that's a vault. So you need to make sure because some of them are mild bilateral CP also. So you have to make sure that you, you know for certain whether the left uh, ankle kinematics is compensatory or whether it's part of the primary pathology. And that's very important because you're going to do an operation on, the, on this child and if you're going to operate on the right leg and there's a problem in the left leg, do it at the same time. You don't want to subject this child to two separate operations. So that's a very important finding to make sure that you've examined the left side properly, do a confusion test and, you know, correlate it with the MRI brain findings, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. So that's very important to make sure that you are dealing with a pure hemiplegic problem or, you know, they can, because a lot of the bilateral CP, they, they, are, they are asymmetrical. 
do you consider mri imaging to uh, to evaluate whether no. it's a uh, uh, not really or... i mean to see none of no single investigation or physical exam finding is going to give you the answer it is what is the clinical syndrome how how does everything uh, relate to each other so if i if this child had periventricular leukomalacia then that would make me think more in terms of an asymmetric diplegic or asymmetric bilateral pattern whereas if this child had a dense you know large um uh, hole in the in the left side of the brain i know okay this is hemiplegia right so so that you know it it, it so you can you can to some extent use mri findings but none of these things are are useful in isolation it's always a combination of it okay we'll we'll proceed with the case yes these are the okay so there is there is a very specific um movement of the right ankle that's happening could anyone identify what that is there's something that's happening there and even though it is uh, the the ankle is in severe fixed equinus you can still see it yeah can anyone see that a bit of dynamic it's supination a, ah no it's a varus flake so dynamic supination is a um is a swing phase event yeah now because dynamic supination is because of overactivity of tibialis anterior yeah, yeah. right which is a swing phase muscle so here you are seeing it in the stance phase mm. and in the stance phase tibialis posterior is more active and mm. some one of the um um residents has said is there a thrust so it's not called a thrust but I, you you have you have spotted that movement it's called a varus flick Mm-hmm. right it's called a varus flick at push off if you yeah. slow down this video just at push off you can see that little flick mm. so that's called a varus flick at push off and it is suggestive of tibialis posterior spasticity so just like dynamic supination in swing is mm-hmm. suggestive of tibialis anterior spasticity varus flick at push off is tibialis posterior spasticity and that again agrees with your physical exam findings because you found that there was an overactive tibialis posterior on your physical exam you mentioned that right yes sir. Yeah. yes sir. so so it's all coming together now so you you you've got multiple bits of evidence clinical evidence that's pointing towards where this problem is coming from and that will obviously guide your treatment plan yeah, yeah. so <laughs> with this with a type 3 spastic hemiplegic gait pattern we in turn for planning for management of these child and so for management of an equinocleo varus foot and cerebral palsy there are three uh, modes of management just a soft tissue procedure soft tissue with a bony procedure and only bony procedure so for the hind foot varus for colven block test for this case uh, showed it to be partially correctable so it turned to neutral to slight valgus on colven block test which suggested that it was a correctable deformity and not a complete uh, bony deformity had developed and uh, so the bony it's not about is, bony yeah. deformity it's about yeah. fixed deformity yeah, yeah. so mm-hmm. initially in a in a cavus foot the hind foot varus is compensatory to the four foot cavus but over a period of time the hind foot varus becomes becomes a fixed. Um, fixed. Fixed, fixed deformity so you have to correct both so what the colman block test tells you is whether you need to do only a four foot procedure or whether you need to do a four foot and a hind foot procedure whether you want to do soft tissue or bony is a is a is a different matter but it it just tells you whether the whether you know whether the hind foot deformity hind is foot. flexible or not yeah okay yes. so uh the pathophysiology of equine equino keo varus foot is well known that equinus for hemiplegics is because of Uh, spastic gastrocnemius as well as soleus the cavus is because of a plantar flex first tray as well as some amount of peroneal imbalance varus occurs because of a variety of causes in in different uh, cases uh, uh, the study has shows that in some cases tibialis posterior spasticity is responsible in some cases tibialis anterior and, and in some cases both of them 
uh, weak intrinsics and uh, imbalance in the extrinsics causes the virus. So in 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 uh, hemiplegic CP, cavus is caused by weak tibialis anterior. Yeah. So yes. weakness of tibialis anterior is a very significant um, cause of that. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So a variety of soft tissue procedures have been mentioned so, in the what literature. What did you do? Yeah. So what we did was. Uh, we, for the cavus, we initially did a percutaneous plantar fascia release, which did not completely correct the cavus. So a medial cuneiform plantar wedge opening osteotomy was done and cavus was well corrected. After that, a sliding uh, tibialis posterior, uh, a sliding T8 anatomy and a uh, aponeurotic lengthening of the tibialis posterior was performed and a uh, peroneus longus to brevis transfer was performed for this case. And uh, it's uh, three years, four years post-operative now. And this is the current gait pattern of the child. Um, how long is the child using an orthotic now? No, the, ch the child used orthotic, uh, orthotic for uh, two years post-operatively and is on and off orthotics. Yeah, I think that's that's reasonable, but it's the commonest reason for recurrence in India. I find is lack of proper orthotic use post-op. That's a very common cause of recurrence because uh, parents think that the reason the surgery is being done is because to avoid an orthotic, and it's very important to reinforce to parents, particularly cerebral palsy, that in spite of the surgery, for one or two hours they have to one or two years, sorry, they have to use. Uh, significant periods of time in the AF for like eight hours a day during the daytime, not a, not not just a nighttime split. But this so, is uh, like Jayant in this case now, as you mentioned earlier, the child is now ended up in a bit of foot foot drop gait. So T band weakness is now more evident, and that's why this peroneus longus is overactive. So although the deformity gets corrected well. <clears throat> But they'll need to continue wearing orthosis, maybe. So, uh, what, so what I am doing now, my standard protocol for this is to retension the tibialis anterior. In all cases, whenever I'm correcting in a hemiplegic, not in a diplegic, in a hemiplegic, any equinus correction is automatically accompanied by retensioning of the tibialis anterior. So I do it like a clubfoot operation make a drill hole in the middle cuneiform, in the intermediate cuneiform, because I don't want to give too much of an aversion force. Otherwise they go into, because all of these muscles are weak, but they're also spastic. So you might get too much of aversion. So I make a drill hole in the middle cuneiform bone, and then I tension it just like club foot operation and stitch the tendon over a button in the sole of the foot. So you shift the so band there? Shift the band to the middle. So, okay. and, and, um, um, so what that does is it, it rebalances the forces a little bit um, and it also allows them in the longer term, maybe like in this case after two years, to perhaps get rid of the orthotic because after the age of 12 or 13, most children will not use an orthotic. So uh, Siddhanshu, I agree that this child has first MTP flexion. So I wait and I don't do this Robert Jones together. If they have significant drop, then I would uh, do that. But you, uh, can't, you, yeah, you can't do a Robert Jones procedure in a younger child because you have to do an IP joint fusion. Um, uh, otherwise, they'll get hallux flexus. So, um, uh, because the proximal phalanx uh, um, growth plate is still open uh, and the distal phalanx growth plate is still open, until they reach skeletal maturity, 14, 15 years, you can't do a Jones procedure. So you know, it's very interesting that when we do T-band transfer in, in club foot, they, they don't develop this phenomenon, dropping of uh, this uh, MTP joint. But it is evidently seen in some CP cases or CMT cases because their hallux extends, their EHL is also weak. Weak, yeah. The patients who have weak EHL, they would readily develop this uh, first MTP to go down. But we seldom see that in um, uh, in uh, club foot where we do this operation very frequently. You know, it was a routine in poliomyelitis patients. All the seniors when they perform this T band transfer, they used to perform this surgeries distal as well because it was a rule rule that it will happen. 
so we waited uh, uh, sudan said four years there is no not much problem so we have not done that uh, the question no this uh, why we presented this case is is uh, abhay court in this posi he said that we for all equino ko whereas in cp hemi we have one uh, uh, prescription fractional lengthening of t post t band transfer for cutaneous plantar release and and ta release so they have not been using peroneus longus to bravis transfer for cp but they use it for cmt or other neurologic uh, condition what i feel is if t band is weak the peroneus longus is overactive and to just transferring t band will not correct the cavus force on the contrary it will leave this peroneus uh, unattended i mean it may keep on uh, peroneus Where longus we do this transfer peroneus longus to brevis we transfer just tied to the it? brevis peroneus brevis no where where do you where do you do it which part of the foot peroneus longus oh you do it in the lateral part of the foot yeah yeah so i hmm. just uh, 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 cut the, below the fifth metatarsal then loosely tied Uh, with the periosteum fifth metatarsal and the rest of the peroneus longus, I'll tie with peroneus brevis. So uh, another way of doing it is behind the fibula. Ah. Uh. So go above the lateral malleolus, a small incision. So you will see peroneus longus and brevis tendons together. So what I tend to do is take a two vicral sutures, which will tie side to side longus and brevis, and then I'll cut longus <laughs> distally. Okay. So that's another way of doing it. Anyway, so so, have you done peroneus longus to brevis in CP or? Uh, yeah, yeah, all the time. So I am I am a so I either transfer longus to brevis or brevis to longus. <laughs> Most of my operations are not complete without this, and I do it. I mean, I don't know what additional effect it has, uh, because the peroneals are not very important Strong. muscles in gait. They are mm -hmm. they have more of a stabilizing effect rather than a. power generating effect um so when we look at gait analysis we know that you know they are there are accessory muscles which are important for control of the foot mm. the, and whereas the tibialis anterior and the and the calf and the tip post they are all huge muscles that that generate a lot of force yeah. uh, so the peroneals have a slightly different mode of action but i do feel that they are important contributors to deformity and therefore they are they are also they could be potential contributors to recurrence of deformity so i feel that doing transfers of longus to brevis and brevis to longus uh, for varus and valgus respectively i think they are good additional or accessory operations after you have done the main correction yeah so i think they you know they are they are useful adjuncts to the main deformity correction that we do yeah gaurav you want to ask something gaurav yes sir i wanted to know uh, I mean, uh, Jain sir, do you cut the uh, peroneus longus from that incision only, which is above the fibula, or you go distally and then cut? No, no, no. I just cut it there, right there, okay. just above the about three, four centimeters above the fibula. We just make a, a you know like a two centimeter incision, just open the peroneal compartment, uh, and then uh, stitch longus and brevis together, and just cut longus. It's a very, it's a five minute operation. I mean, you can do it in the foot also. There's nothing wrong about doing it in the foot, but I just have a slightly different way of doing it. So I just thought I'd share with you. That's, okay. That's what uh, this um, uh, Mosca's book mentions. Uh, to do below the below the retina film. Yeah. Is there any risk of uh, dorsal bunion formation in CP when peroneus longus is cut? now probably like the t band is weak and peroneus longus is overactive that's why it develops this cavus so when we take off the peroneus longus i tend to tie with the fifth metatarsal periosteum so that it doesn't become completely so it has a kind of tenodizing effect you know so uh, at the same time it is now not, not uh, over pulling this metatarsal down so i haven't seen that uh, dorsal bunion but i agree that if you just leave it loose and if the vent is working then it may end up with uh, dorsal bunion dorsal bunion is more of a problem in the higher gmfcs uh, mm. level children uh, we don't 
frequently see it in GMFCS levels one and two. It's it's more of a three or four problem, and particularly when there's dystonia and Alex plexus and all that, we tend to see dorsal bunion in them. And the the way to deal with a dorsal bunion, the most reliable way in my experience, is to do a first mm -hmm. MTP fusion at skeletal maturity. Okay. Um, I don't think little soft tissue procedures, FHL tenotomy, all that, you know, it may work to delay the progression of deformity, but really you need a very robust operation to deal with the dorsal bunion and see. Right on. So I think we should, uh, we should conclude this session here. It took a little longer time, but the cases were interesting and uh, experts were there to guide us through. Thank you very much, everyone. And uh, thanks, Jayan, for your time. Yeah, thank you, Molin, for the we'll, opportunity. Everyone will meet this just two days later. We'll meet on Saturday with Dr. Sandeep Patwardhan with the weekly fellow curriculum. And he will talk about SCAFI, my approach, and he will describe the Porsche technique and uh, some technical tips about how to manage SCAFI cases. So see you then. Bye. Thanks, Jayant, again. Bye-bye. Take care. Thank you, sir. Thanks, Shalin and Sheenam, for nice presentations.